Hello, I'm Michael Brown, and each year for the past 13 years, Montgomery College has hosted the F. Scott Fitzgerald Literary Conference. The conference is a celebration of writing in all its forms and includes workshops, readings, and discussions with noted authors. A highlight of each conference is the presentation of the F. Scott Fitzgerald Literary Award. Past winners include John Updike, E.L. Doctorow, Norman Mailer, Pat Conroy, and many other well-known authors. This year's awardee is Elmore Dutch Leonard. Mr. Leonard follows in the same tradition of excellence of those who came before him and is a very fitting addition to this illustrious list of honorees. Mr. Leonard is an extremely prolific author, having written such novels as Ombre, Mr. Majestic, Freaky Deaky, Get Shorty, Rum Punch, Up in Honey's Room, and many more. And in addition, many of his novels and stories have been developed into movies and television shows, including most of the novels I just mentioned. Now, welcome, Mr. Leonard. It is an honor to have you here with us today, and congratulations on winning the 2008 F. Scott Fitzgerald Literary Award. Michael, thank you. Yeah, it's good to be here. I, uh, Looking down the list, I, I see that I know or I have met seven of the uh, 12 awardees up to, up to this time. Well, it's, it's quite an impressive list. And, it is, uh, it is. It's a special project for, here at, uh, for us here at Montgomery College Television, something I look forward to every year. So it's a real pleasure to, uh, to meet you and get a chance to talk with you. Thanks. Let's start at the very beginning. When did you start writing and what were some of, who were some of your early influences? Well, I was influenced by Hemingway more than anyone else. I started writing in 1950. I graduated from University of Detroit that year. And then I, I looked at, I considered Westerns as a way to go because in the 50s, Westerns were big. You could sell to the Saturday Evening Post, Collier's, other magazines like Argosy, where I sold my first one, and um, there were a dozen pulp magazines, and the better ones were, were paying two cents a word. So a 5,000 word story was 100 bucks, and in, in the early 50s, that wasn't bad. See? So that's, I got into that, and I think maybe the first two were rejected, and then I began uh, researching, uh, studying Arizona and New Mexico in the 1880s what cowboys did, what they wore, what kind of coffee they drank, what kind of guns they used, all of that. And, and I used it, and it seemed to work. Yeah. yeah, pretty much your writing career in the 50s was pretty much all Westerns, yeah. correct? Mm -hmm. What made you switch to the crime and the mystery genre? The market. The market uh, dropped. It, it, uh, it just went out of sight. Uh, because all the Westerns suddenly, by the late 50s, were on television. And I thought they were all bad because they were written by guys who didn't know anything about the West and they all ended with a gunfight in the street. Two guys facing each other and let's see who can draw first, you know, which probably never happened, <laughs> ever happened in the West. So I, and I, I don't think in, I, I wrote 30 short stories and five books, and I never had that scene of the two meeting face to face. One of those stories was uh, 310 to Yuma, which was made into two Two, movies. yeah. And um, the, uh, pr the producers asked me about the second one. I was in, in Hollywood, and they invited me to their offices, and I, they showed me the picture, and then they asked me questions about it. And I said, I thought it was a good-looking picture, except that it misses the point of the original 310 to Yuma, which is between the, the guy representing the law and the outlaw, and he's holding him until 310 to Yuma. I mean, 310, uh, uh, the, uh, until the train leaves at 310, which Walter Winchell called three hours and 10 minutes after high noon, <laughs> which there was some truth in that. But the... The short story was uh, 4,500 words. It was in Dime Western, and I got $90 for it. <laughs> so, but the ending, the ending of the second one, I thought, made no sense at all. So. Well, that's interesting. Now, let's talk about your writing style a little bit. 
in your novel, Be Cool, uh, which is one of my favorites, your main character is Chili Palmer, and he talks about his approach to writing in the book. He says it, he doesn't think of a plot first and then put characters in it. Instead, he starts with the characters. He gets to know them. He gets to know them very intimately. And then he lets them take him where the story is going to go, so to speak. Now, he says once you know them, well, then you know where the story is going. Is this Elmore Leonard speaking that, directly yeah, through? Yeah, and, and that, that seems to be true. It's simplified, but, it's, but it is true. I think of it, there is a situation. There's got to be a situation I start with, and I begin to put characters into it. Just a, just a few, the main character. I saw a picture, for example, photographed in the news of a, of a female U.S. Marshal, and she's standing in front of the Miami uh, federal courthouse with a shotgun on her hip like that. The stock is against her hip. And uh, I said, I said to uh, Greg Sutter, my researcher, I said, she's a book. And, and, I di and she became um, out of sight. Yeah. Uh, Karen Sisko. Karen Sisko, yeah. Now I'm using Karen Sisko again in a book that I, right now I'm on page five. And you've got to be on page five sometime, you know. And Karen has left the Marshal Service, and now she's working for her dad, who's a private investigator. So we'll see what happens. I, don't, I have no idea what, where it's going. I mean, I have a, just the beginning of an idea. I always have the beginning of, uh, of an idea, but uh, never, ever the ending. The characters but, take you there. Yeah, and, and I just presume there's a way to end it. They're all, <laughs> they all end somehow, you know. <laughs> that is great. Now, I've read uh, a couple of articles recently where you talk about your sound. And you mentioned the Out of Sight film, uh, Steven Soderbergh's version of your novel, Out of Sight. And you say that movie sounded like you. Yeah. What, what is the Elmore Leonard sound? Well, the, the sound is... Is, it's really not me because I'm, I'm hiding. It's the sound of the characters, but they all have my sound. Not all of them, but the, the main ones have my sound. And it's a simplified, uh, you, you come up with uh, that ending of a scene line. You know, it's all, and, and, and you can write it, while you're writing it, you might not have that zinger at the end of a scene right away. But you know that in subsequent months it will come to you, and then you go back and throw it in. See, so they sound pretty uh, f fast, and uh, they're 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 cool. It's in a, it's a line that just nails it. But I don't have to nail it immediately. I can go back and nail it. You see. Sounds like you're if you're not writing, you're thinking about it all the time. Is that true? Just about all the time. I try and close uh, shut it off at six o'clock. But I'll, I'll continue to think about it. I'll take my shower at 6 o'clock, and I'm still thinking about it. But, uh, but if, if, I, if I can work from 9 or 10 or 11, because I'm starting later as I get older. I used to uh, get up at, uh, I used to start at 9, from 9 to 6. And when I was working at an ad agency, I'd get up at 5, and I'd write for two hours. And at that time, I could uh, write a page an hour because I didn't know any better. I'd just write it, you know. But it gets harder. It keeps getting harder and harder all the time. Hmm. I don't want to repeat myself. Even after 42 novels? Yeah, even after, yeah.